This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 8 Recovering from my astonishment at the beautiful scene before me, I quickly awakened Toby and informed him of the discovery I had made. Together, we now repaired to the border of the precipice, and my companion's admiration was equal to my own. A little reflection, however, abated our surprise at coming so unexpectedly upon this valley, since the large vales of Hapar and Taipee, lying upon this side of Nukahiva, and extending a considerable distance from the sea towards the interior, must necessarily terminate somewhere about this point. The question now was as to which of those two places we were looking down upon. Toby insisted that it was the abode of the Hapars, and I that it was tenanted by their enemies, the ferocious Taipees. To be sure, I was not entirely convinced by my own arguments, but Toby's proposition to descend at once into the valley and partake of the hospitality of its inmates seemed to me to be risking so much upon the strength of a mere supposition that I resolved to oppose it until we had more evidence to proceed upon. The point was one of vital importance, as the natives of Hapar were not only at peace with Nukahiva, but cultivated with its inhabitants the most friendly relations, and enjoyed beside a reputation for gentleness and humanity, which led us to expect from them, if not a cordial reception, at least a shelter during the short period we should remain in their territory. On the other hand, the very name of Taipee struck a panic into my heart, which I did not attempt to disguise. The thought of voluntarily throwing ourselves into the hands of these cruel savages seemed to me an act of mere madness, and almost equally so the idea of venturing into the valley, uncertain by which of these two tribes it was inhabited that the veil at our feet was tenanted by one of them was a point that appeared to us past all doubt, since we knew that they resided in this quarter, although our information did not enlighten us further. My companion, however, incapable of resisting the tempting prospect which the place held out of an abundant supply of food and other means of enjoyment, still clung to his own inconsiderate view of the subject, nor could all my reasoning shake it. When I reminded him that it was impossible for either of us to know anything with certainty, and when I dwelt upon the horrible fate we should encounter were we rashly to descend into the valley and discover too late the error we had committed, he replied by detailing all the evils of our present condition, and the sufferings we must undergo should we continue to remain where we then were. Anxious to draw him away from the subject, if possible, for I saw that it would be in vain to attempt changing his mind, I directed his attention to a long, bright, unwooded tract of land, which, sweeping down from the elevations in the interior, descended into the valley before us. I then suggested to him that beyond this ridge might lie a capacious and untenanted valley, abounding with all manner of delicious fruits, for I had heard that there were several such upon the island and proposed that we should endeavor to reach it, and if we found our expectations realized, we should at once take refuge in it, and remain there as long as we pleased. He acquiesced in the suggestion, and we immediately, therefore, began surveying the country lying before us, with a view of determining upon the best route for us to pursue. But it presented little choice, the whole interval being broken into steep ridges, divided by dark ravines, extending in parallel lines at right angles to our direct course. All these we would be obliged to cross before we could hope to arrive at our destination. A weary journey. But we decided to undertake it, though for my own part I felt little prepared to encounter its fatigues, shivering and burning by turns with the ague and fever, for I know not how else to describe the alternate sensations I experienced and suffering not a little from the lameness which afflicted me. Added to this was the faintness consequent on our meager diet, a calamity in which Toby participated to the same extent as myself. 
These circumstances, however, only augmented my anxiety to reach a place which promised us plenty and repose, before I should be reduced to a state which would render me altogether unable to perform the journey. Accordingly, we now commenced it by descending the almost perpendicular side of a steep and narrow gorge, bristling with a thick growth of reeds. Here there was but one mode for us to adopt. We seated ourselves upon the ground, and guided our descent by catching at the canes in our path. The velocity with which we thus slid down the side of the ravine soon brought us to a point where we could use our feet, and in a short time we arrived at the edge of the torrent, which rolled impetuously along the bed of the chasm. After taking a refreshing draught from the water of the stream, we addressed ourselves to a much more difficult undertaking than the last. Every foot of our late descent had to be regained in ascending the opposite side of the gorge, an operation rendered the less agreeable from the consideration that in these perpendicular episodes we did not progress an hundred yards on our journey. But, ungrateful as the task was, we set about it with exemplary patience, and after a snail-like progress of an hour or more, had scaled perhaps one half of the distance, when the fever which had left me for a while returned with such violence and accompanied by so raging a thirst that it required all the entreaties of Toby to prevent me from losing all the fruits of my late exertion by precipitating myself madly down the cliffs we had just climbed in quest of the water which flowed so temptingly at their base. At the moment, all my hopes and fears appeared to be merged in this one desire, careless of the consequences that might result from its gratification. I am aware of no feeling, either of pleasure or of pain, that so completely deprives one of all power to resist its impulses, as this same raging thirst. Toby earnestly conjured me to continue the ascent, assuring me that a little more exertion would bring us to the summit, and that then in less than five minutes we should find ourselves at the brink of the stream, which must necessarily flow on the other side of the ridge. Do not, he exclaimed, turn back. Now that we have proceeded thus far, for I tell you that neither of us will have the courage to repeat the attempt if once more we find ourselves looking up to where we now are from the bottom of these rocks. I was not yet so perfectly beside myself as to be heedless of these representations, and therefore toiled on, ineffectually endeavoring to appease the thirst which consumed me, by thinking that in a short time I should be able to gratify it to my heart's content. At last, we gained the top of the second elevation, the loftiest of those I have described as extending in parallel lines between us and the valley we desired to reach. It commanded a view of the whole intervening distance, and, discouraged as I was by other circumstances, this prospect plunged me into the very depths of despair. Nothing but dark and fearful chasms, separated by sharp-crested and perpendicular ridges as far as the eye could reach. Could we have stepped from summit to summit of these steep but narrow elevations, we could easily have accomplished the distance. But we must penetrate to the bottom of every yawning gulf, and scale in succession every one of the eminences before us. Even Toby, although not suffering as I did, was not proof against the disheartening influences of the sight. But we did not long stand to contemplate it, impatient as I was to reach the waters of the torrent which flowed beneath us. With an insensibility to danger which I cannot call to mind without shuddering, we threw ourselves down the depths of the ravine, startling its savage solitudes with the echoes produced by the falling fragments of rock we every moment dislodged from their places, careless of the insecurity of our footing, and reckless whether the slight roots and twigs we clutched at sustained us for the while, or treacherously yielded to our grasp. For my own part I scarcely knew whether I was helplessly falling from the heights above, or whether the fearful rapidity with which I descended was an act of my own volition. In a few minutes we reached the foot of the gorge, and kneeling upon a small ledge of dripping rocks, I bent over to the stream. What a delicious sensation was I now to experience! I paused for a second to concentrate all my capabilities of enjoyment, and then emerged my lips in the clear element before me. 
had the apples of Sodom turned to ashes in my mouth, I could not have felt a more startling revulsion. A single drop of the cold fluid seemed to freeze every drop of blood in my body. The fever that had been burning in my veins gave place on the instant to death-like chills, which shook me one after another like so many shocks of electricity, while the perspiration produced by my late violent exertions congealed in icy beads upon my forehead. My thirst was gone, and I fairly loathed the water. Starting to my feet, the sight of those dank rocks, oozing forth moisture at every crevice, and the dark stream shooting along its dismal channel, sent fresh chills through my shivering frame, and I felt as uncontrollable a desire to climb up towards the genial sunlight as I before had to descend the ravine. After two hours' perilous exertions, we stood upon the summit of another ridge, and it was with difficulty I could bring myself to believe that we had ever penetrated the black and yawning chasm which then gaped at our feet. Again we gazed upon the prospect which the height commanded, but it was just as depressing as the one which had before met our eyes. I now felt that in our present situation it was in vain for us to think of ever overcoming the obstacles in our way, and I gave up all thoughts of reaching the veil which lay beyond this series of impediments, while at the same time I could not devise any scheme to extricate ourselves from the difficulties in which we were involved. The remotest idea of returning to Nukahiva, unless assured of our vessel's departure, never once entered my mind, and indeed it was questionable whether we could have succeeded in reaching it, divided as we were from the bay by a distance we could not compute, and perplexed, too, in our remembrance of localities by our recent wanderings. Besides, it was unendurable the thought of retracing our steps and rendering all our painful exertions of no avail. There is scarcely anything, when a man is in difficulties, that he is more disposed to look upon with abhorrence than a right-about retrograde movement, a systematic going over of the already trodden ground, and especially if he has a love of adventure, such a course appears indescribably repulsive, so long as there remains the least hope to be derived from braving untried difficulties. It was this feeling that prompted us to descend the opposite side of the elevation we had just scaled, although with what definite object in view it would have been impossible for either of us to tell. Without exchanging a syllable upon the subject, Toby and myself simultaneously renounced the design which had lured us thus far, perceiving in each other's countenances that desponding expression which speaks more eloquently than words. Together, we stood towards the close of this weary day in the cavity of the third gorge we had entered, wholly incapacitated for any further exertion, until restored to some degree of strength by food and repose. We seated ourselves upon the least uncomfortable spot we could select, and Toby produced from the bosom of his frock the sacred package. In silence, we partook of the small morsel of refreshment that had been left from the morning's repast, and without once proposing to violate the sanctity of our engagement with respect to the remainder, we rose to our feet and proceeded to construct some sort of shelter under which we might obtain the sleep we so greatly needed. Fortunately, the spot was better adapted to our purpose than the one in which we had passed the last wretched night. We cleared away the tall reeds from a small but almost level bit of ground, and twisted them into a low basket-like hut, which we covered with a profusion of long, thick leaves, gathered from a tree near at hand. We disposed them thickly all around, reserving only a slight opening that barely permitted us to crawl under the shelter we had thus obtained. These deep recesses, though protected from the winds that assail the summits of their lofty sides, are damp and chill to a degree that one would hardly anticipate in such a climate, and being unprovided with anything but our woolen frocks and thin duck trousers to resist the cold of the place, we were the more solicitous to render our habitation for the night as comfortable as we could. Accordingly, in addition to what we had already done, we plucked down all the leaves within our reach, and threw them in a heap over our little hut, 
into which we now crept, raking after us a reserved supply to form our couch. That night, nothing but the pain I suffered prevented me from sleeping most refreshingly. As it was, I caught two or three naps, while Toby slept away at my side as soundly as though he had been sandwiched between two holland sheets. Luckily it did not rain, and we were preserved from the misery which a heavy shower would have occasioned us. In the morning I was awakened by the sonorous voice of my companion ringing in my ears and bidding me rise. I crawled out from our heap of leaves, and was astonished at the change which a good night's rest had wrought in his appearance. He was as blithe and joyous as a young bird, and was staying the keenness of his morning's appetite by chewing the soft bark of a delicate branch he held in his hand, and he recommended the like to me as an admirable antidote against the gnawings of hunger. For my own part, though feeling materially better than I had done the preceding evening, I could not look at the limb that had pained me so violently at intervals during the last twenty-four hours without experiencing a sense of alarm that I strove in vain to shake off. Unwilling to disturb the flow of my comrade's spirits, I managed to stifle the complaints to which I might otherwise have given vent, and calling upon him good-humouredly to speed our banquet, I prepared myself for it by washing in the stream. This operation concluded, we swallowed, or rather absorbed, by a peculiar kind of slow sucking process, our respective morsels of nourishment, and then entered into a discussion as to the steps it was necessary for us to pursue. "'What's to be done now?' inquired I, rather dolefully. "'Descend into that same valley we described yesterday,' rejoined Toby, with a rapidity and loudness of utterance that almost led me to suspect he had been slyly devouring the broad side of an ox in some of the adjoining thickets. "'What else?' he continued. "'Remains for us to do but that, to be sure.' Why, we shall both starve to a certainty if we remain here, and as to your fears of those Taipees, depend upon it, it is all nonsense. It is impossible that the inhabitants of such a lovely place as we saw can be anything else but good fellows. And if you choose rather to perish with hunger in one of these soppy caverns, I for one prefer to chance a bold descent into the valley, and risk the consequences. And who is to pilot us thither? I asked. Even if we should decide upon the measure you propose, are we to go again up and down those precipices that we crossed yesterday, until we reach the place we started from, and then take a flying leap from the cliffs to the valley? Faith, I didn't think of that, said Toby. Sure enough, both sides of the valley appeared to be hemmed in by precipices, didn't they? Yes, answered I, as steep as the sides of a line of battleship and about a hundred times as high. My companion sank his head upon his breast and remained for a while in deep thought. Suddenly he sprang to his feet, while his eyes lighted up with that gleam of intelligence that marks the presence of some bright idea. "'Yes, yes!' he exclaimed. "'The streams all run in the same direction, and must necessarily flow into the valley before they reach the sea. All we have to do is just to follow the stream, and sooner or later it will lead us into the vale.' "'You are right, Toby,' I exclaimed. You are right. It must conduct us thither, and quickly too, for see what a steep inclination the water descends. It does indeed, burst forth my companion, overjoyed at my verification of his theory. It does indeed. Why, it is as plain as a pikestaff. Let us proceed at once. Come, throw away all those stupid ideas about the Taipees, and hurrah for the lovely valley of the Hapars. You will have it to be Hapar, I see, my dear fellow. "'Pray heaven you may not find yourself deceived,' observed I, with a shake of my head. "'Amen to all that and much more,' shouted Toby, rushing forward. "'But Hapar it is, for nothing else than Hapar can it be. "'So glorious a valley, such forests of breadfruit trees, "'such groves of coconut, such wildernesses of guava bushes. "'Ah, shipmate, don't linger behind. "'In the name of all delightful fruits, I am dying to be at them. "'Come on, come on, shove ahead. "'There's a lively lad.' Never mind the rocks, kick them out of the way as I do, and tomorrow, old fellow, take my word for it, we shall be in clover. Come on! And so saying, he dashed along the ravine like a madman, forgetting my inability to keep up with him. 
In a few minutes, however, the exuberance of his spirits abated, and pausing for a while, he permitted me to overtake him.